So first I would like to present myself, Kamala Alawa, as a school student in Master of Science, and also the chair of Women in Engineering at Trinity School of the Arts and Women in Engineering Student Association. So today we're pleased to have uh, Francoise Chamba with us. She's uh, the chairwoman and the co-founder of uh, Melectric, a Belgian semiconductor company. Uh, her talk uh, today will be about innovation and between men and women. So the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Maya. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, bonjour. Ça va bien? Okay, très bien. Uh, alors, um, I will. I need to teach you English, of course. Uh, just wanted to uh, say that if afterwards you have questions and you prefer French, we can do that, and I'll answer in English if that's okay, right? Good. So um, here I am. I'm a feminist meaning um, very much in favor of all the STEM disciplines because I think they are the best thing that uh, we can do, the best thing that you can study in order to uh, uh, yeah, solve all the problems uh, or contribute to solving all the problems in the world. And I'm a feminist because I'm very much in favor of diversity uh, and inclusion. And that's why the talk innovation is how do we innovate in order to make tomorrow's world better than today's? And how can we make the world work for everyone? Now, um, thank you for the introduction, Maya. And uh, I will first show you a little movie, which gives you a bit of a, an idea of what Melexic is doing, uh, rather than me telling you. There's nothing, uh, um, so there's no talk, there's music. Um, but I think you will get the, the point, so you will see the products that pop up in the movie. Those are the products where you can, the Melexic products that you find in, uh, in your daily application. Should work. It doesn't work. We made it work. Okay, let's go one back. Let's see if that yes. So that's very close by, yeah? that's in uh, Ypres. Just across the border. Alexis has uh, quite some um, uh, products in uh, things that you are using uh, in your daily life. Uh, in cars, we have on average 18 plus. Uh, every new car that is being built has 18 plus, but some have, have many more, um, like um, 50 or 60 in almost all the Teslas, uh, or 170 even in uh, the latest EQS uh, model of, uh, of Mercedes. Now, we're a company that, uh, has, that is rooted in Belgium, uh, but we're uh, present across three continents with uh, a bit more than 2,000 people today, and we do 70% of our sales outside of uh, Europe. Um, so, Today we speak about innovation and inclusion. And the question is, are they a yin-yang? Now yin-yang, let's start with the definitions. A yin-yang is in fact a Chinese philosophical concept uh, that you probably know. And it is used uh, to express that the world is um, composed of paradoxes, of things that are seemingly opposing uh, to one another, like light and darkness, but you can't have one without the other. Uh, it's used also to say female, male uh, energy. But in fact, uh, a yin-yang is the concept that says you need both in order to make a world. In order to make things work, you need both. That's why it's round. And in some cases, they even sketch some uh, uh, movement uh, around it. 
Now, innovation is not the same as invention. If you do research, you could do an invention, but that's not yet an innovation. Because innovation starts whether it's desirable for the market to have, for the world uh, to have. That is always the first question. And then it has to be feasible from a technical point of view, uh, which it could be an invention, could be also feasible, but maybe not viable. Maybe you can't make it for a price or for a cost uh, that people in general are willing uh, to pay for. So innovation is not the same as invention. And what is the difference between diversity and inclusion? Well, diversity is a state. You are very diverse here. You're invited to the party, but if, you're not, if people don't invite you to dance, then you're, you don't have an inclusive culture. So that's a bit the difference uh, between uh, diversity and inclusion, and you need it, in fact, both. In many instances, they say DEIB, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And we'll come to that probably during the, uh, during the podcast. Okay, so the question to ask today is, are they a yin yang? Do they give rise to each other? Are they in the interdependent uh, of each other? And of course, my claim is yes. Let's prove it. Let's do a little test, very small test. So I want you to close your eyes, really close your eyes. And when I say you can open them, same for the people online, when you open them, you will see a picture and then you have to take the first idea that comes to your mind. Okay, ready? So close your eyes, everyone. And now open them. First ID. First ID. What do you see? A duck. A duck. Rabbit. 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 So what happens here? You look at the same picture, and there are two different IDs coming out of that picture. You have many of those. Ah, you can find them uh, online. It, this is called the rabbit duck illusion, very simply. Uh, it appears also when it's Easter, people often, more often see uh, the, the rabbit than the duck. <laughs> I have no scientific evidence for that. But what happened uh, here? Um, you have an idea, your first ID, whether it's one or the other, it's very difficult then to see, oh yes, I see the other side. You need somebody else to tell you, but I saw the other, I saw something else. So what happened here is you have A, your IDs are conflicting. That is the first um, concept that you need or the first uh, prerequisite condition for innovation. You need a lot of conflict of ideas because you can't get to a true innovation. Remember, it has three uh, elements. You can't get to a true innovation if you don't have all the perspectives. Second ID, or second capability, key capability or crucial component of innovation. What could that be? Think SpaceX. Think SpaceX. What happens a lot with SpaceX? They fail, they fail absolutely. See, we have PhD students. They <laughs> know how to answer this. Error is the, sa is the next key capability for innovation. You need to try. And it's sometimes really, really messy. Yeah? The history of being spectacularly right is preceded by a history of being even more spectacularly wrong. And SpaceX, they celebrate when the rocket uh, goes in the air and then it explodes or it doesn't go in the air. They, they celebrate <laughs> because they say, ah, we found at least one way not to do it. Let's find a way how to make it work. So that's the second key capability. Let's try a third one. Give me, give me something. What do you also need? 
if you want conflict of ideas and being allowed to, um, to make errors, to make mistakes, yes. Discussions, yeah. So, and in the discussions, you take a stand. You have a certain behavior. You have a certain attitude. You need to be open-minded. You need to be curious. You need to somehow feel passionate about what you do. Play with, uh, with, with things. And go also in your head from, ah, this will never work. God damn it, this will never work. Is it allowed to swear in a classroom? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so it will never work. Whereas on the other side, you have to be able to say, no, no, I will make it work. I will try and try until it works. And I'll get help. And that's where, uh, in fact, that attitude exists of, of an, an open-minded attitude. Now, you need multiple perspectives if you want an innovation to really come uh, and industrialize an innovation, you need different perspectives. Desirability, you need to know the market. Feasibility, okay, there are technical uh, stuff, but also process stuff. You need to manufacture something, design something. Uh, and three, viability. Hey, you need somebody who can uh, calculate the economics behind uh, your innovation. So typically, it is a multidisciplinary thing. But if you look at the world, the world is composed of many people, many, many diverse people. So my claim is the fourth and very important element of uh, innovation is inclusion. It is for any company or any organization a prerequisite <coughs> to really continue innovation. Think about you have a market and it needs to be desirable for the market. If the market is diverse, it is good to have a diverse team that works on that innovation. So for businesses, it is of strategic importance to foster an inclusive culture uh, in any company. Let's take a look. When I go and speak to entrepreneurs or to managers or whatever, and I talk about innovation, uh, sorry, about in diversity and inclusion, then I see some doing, uh, there she goes again, <laughs> right? I understand that. But when I address them in a different way and I, and I tell them, okay, look, have, think about your customer base. And let's take women. And I know gender is a spectrum, uh, but let's, for the sake of argument, we take female, male, it's easy, yeah? It's yin yang. So I, I asked them, look at your customer base and how many women uh, you have in your customer base. Easy for a consumer, uh, a, a business to consumer uh, product, pretty easy. If you have a business to business, then you might look at who are the, uh, the, the decision makers in the company that, that you address. Okay, and then keep that percentage. And then look inside inside your company, how many women you have in your sales, in your marketing, in your product development, in your after sales, etc. Keep that percentage and then look at the deficit. How can you uh, make a good product for an as large as possible market if you don't have at least some of those perspectives in your team? And there are big errors that have happened in the past because of, for example, a lack <coughs> in diversity in design teams. Yeah, you could change that into youngsters. You could change that into people with foreign uh, roots, etc. You can change anything there. But there have been problems in the past. Uh, Probably you still remember the Google uh, debacle that in their first recognition software uh, they had um, uh, yeah they had black people that were identified as as chimpanzees or whatever. Also, the first Apple face facial recognition in an iPhone, Asian people could uh, open up each other's phone. Asian women, by the way, could. So apparently not Asian men, but Asian females, yes. So somehow they did not think 
about even testing their software on a diverse uh, community. And why is that? Why is that? Uh, because if, if you don't have the problem, you might think it's not important enough, or you might even not know about it. So how are you doing on time? Sue? Very good, thank you. Um, but we have a problem here, because if you think about design, um, about the design team, so where you have also technical um, personnel uh, to, to design the, or to get to uh, innovation. Yeah, and I'm now counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, you're pretty diverse here. The, 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 the ratio is pretty good, I must say. This, this says that we lose a lot of people along the education career. We lose even more girls than boys along the education career. And we can maybe talk in the podcast about, uh, about that and how that, uh, um, how, so what are the causes of that. We also lose many more women in, during the professional career in technical roles than we lose men. There's clearly a much more leaky STEM pipeline um, as such throughout uh, the, the life of people. And we know if you don't have STEM, forget it. Yeah? You can't go to the party, you stick to the party. We need uh, many more STEM uh, educated profiles of all types. Uh, whether vocational or academic, practical, whatever, we need all types. So how do we unlock this? What can we do about it? Um, the causes are clear. Uh, the solutions come a bit out of the causes. And I'll give you three uh, things, three actions that you can really take yourselves to contribute to changing that uh, in the future. Um, I'll start with the, uh, the one below. Become conscious of our unconscious bias. We all have unconscious bias. Uh, one of the typical unconscious biases uh, in the general public is, for example, uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, it's nothing for girls. That's an unconscious bias that uh, one may have. And what you see is, so what the truth is about having this unconscious bias, the reason is that we are bombarded with all kinds of probably gendered stereotypes in social media, in mainstream media. And if you want to read a good book about this, uh, because there's been a lot of um, progress in neuroscience and psychology, but particularly neuroscience, thanks by the way, to many more uh, STEM profiles who worked on, on better tools. So that progress gives us reasons uh, to believe that the brain of a boy and a girl, when they're born, is more or less the same. Okay, we have our DNA that fixes some things, but nature is only half of the story. Nurture, so the life you lead afterwards, uh, the stimuli you get, from your environment, from your friends, from your parents, from your caregivers, from your teachers, uh, from media uh, in general. Uh, if they bombard you with a lot of gender stereotypes, you will start believing them in them. And just as an example, a boy uh, and a girl's brain do not follow the same journey. Um, think about what you give to a baby girl or a baby boy. You give different things. It's clear and it's also scientifically proven that, and I, I, I see people say, so, no, I'm grateful to understand that there are exceptions, but in general, in general, uh, boys, baby boys are presented more with spatial recognition uh, toys and girls more with social uh, toys like dolls and etc. 
And there is a, this uh, meta study from uh, the European Expert Network on Economics of Education, who has reviewed worldwide uh, what are the educational um, career uh, results uh, in STEM education between boys and, and girls. And the, there are two important um, findings, and one of them has to do with bias. Um, that is, if a teacher, and it could be a male or a female teacher, doesn't make a, a difference really, if that teacher has a pro-boy bias, like, oh yeah, in my head, clearly STEM is for boys, not really for girls, then uh, the potential uh, that girls think they have reduces, and you can really lose them. So it's really part of uh, the, this leaky uh, STEM pipeline. Unconscious bias exists everywhere, um, in education, but also in the corporate world. In the corporate world, we say we don't want older people. Nah, we don't like them. We like young people, which is stupid, really. Because if you look at um, your brain, it is malleable. It is plastic. If you continue to use your brain, and the more problems uh, you have solved in your life, the more difficulties you have uh, needed to address, the better you can connect the dots, the better problem solver you become. That means that it's a, it's a myth that the brain ages uh, while we age. It's not correct. The brain gets better as we age. It changes, but it gets better as you age, if you use it well. And so you can also, you lose uh, cells in your brain. You do lose brain cells, they go away, but you can also make new ones. And the more you read, the more movement, so physical uh, movement, the more social interactions you have, uh, and the more um, cooperation and collaboration you do, the better your brain becomes. It's good news. In the corporate world, it has not arrived yet, that news unfortunately. But in society as large, also inclusion is important. Uh, in uh, times of AI, generative AI and Bing and BARD and uh, ChatGPT, etc., if the database on which these AIs are trained are biased against, could be gender bias, could be ethnicity bias uh, or other biases, then you will get a biased outcome. And so if the demographics of the ones doing or putting uh, this AI on the market, if that demographics, whether it's in the developer community or uh, the ones who take decisions, the decision makers, if that doesn't diversify, we will exacerbate inequality on a global scale. And that's really a big concern that we have to take care of. And so when your big data is corrupted by big silences, uh, also a very good book to read, um, uh, Caroline, Caroline Criado Perez, then um, the, for some, the truths are not true at all. And that's a problem, for example, in uh, medical studies, medical trials, where uh, they don't use women because they're afraid of, yeah, a woman can, be preg can become pregnant, and that's not okay. Uh, if you have a, uh, a trial, could be uh, bad for the baby, and then they don't search for other means to, uh, uh, to do that clinical trial. That means the outcome is maybe valid for men, but not necessarily for, for women. Second thing we can do uh, is uh, showcasing inspiring women in STEM. And that's the one of the, so what, you can't be what you can, can't see, meaning if you can see it, you can be it. And the same study that I mentioned before uh, has also clarified uh, this very well. Even 15 minutes of a diverse, or let's say an underrepresented uh, person could be 
uh, a colored person could be uh, a, um, a woman, only 15 minutes, you put them in front of a class, it increases the self-confidence of girls or of people who recognize uh, themselves in that uh, successful professional. It increases their self-confidence and increases their self-esteem. So it's important you can do that. While being a PhD student, you can go into classrooms. Afterwards, when you go into a job and you're a successful researcher or you're whatever, a uh, successful professional, you are doing something that you're passionate about, go and talk to classrooms about uh, what you're passionate about and you will see that it increases uh, definitely the self-confidence of everyone in that classroom by several percentages. So if you keep that going over an educational career, it really is uh, making a difference and moving the needle. Now there are many, many, many inspiring women. Who do you recognize? Who do you recognize? In Come on, you at least have to recognize some of them. <laughs> Jessica Chastain. Why did I put her on there is because you see movies moving in, so they have realized this, that ah, uh, if we put a, a woman, in this case, uh, as the captain of the spaceship, uh, that was in The Martian, I think, you see that it changes. Again, it's what you, if you can see it, you can be it. So it's very important in movies to put role models uh, in front. But I'm sure you know others, Yes, and Ada was the first, the first programmer. Fantastic. Who else? Marie Curie and her daughter and her granddaughter. <laughs> All three of them Nobel Prize uh, winners, in, if I'm not mistaken. Um, who else? Some French. I added two French that I didn't know. I'm glad always to, uh, to know. Uh, so that lady here, wait a minute. Ah, it doesn't show. Okay. The lady smiling, she's from Google X factory. Uh, apparently she's French. And I was at Google X uh, just two weeks ago. I didn't meet her, I didn't know her yet <laughs> at that time. I met other uh, interesting people, but not her. And then uh, next to that, Jasmine Antonis, who is a VP product and co-founder of Recast AI, bought by SAP. And apparently she studied at Ecole 42 School. You see, you can still, well, I, I do think she had a STEM education uh, before that. But there is somebody else, and I recognized her on your, one of your magazines here when I entered the room. Belgian, very proud of our Belgian Ingrid Dobeschi, the godmother of uh, the image. She is the one who allows images to be uh, sent from, or to be taken and sent uh, around. Uh, so that is that lady. Grace Hopper, one of the first mathematics PhDs. Um, and uh, they call her Grandma Hobal. So who's programming here? Who are programmers? You knew, you knew about Grandma Hobal? Yeah. You did? Yeah. <laughs> Good, good. And then on top, ah oh yeah, and I have a nice, uh, another nice one. Who does chip design here? Okay, many. Do you know that lady? Do you know the Mead Conway revolution? A 
early when the chips were still very difficult to make in the 50s, 60s. Lynn Conway is, by the way, a transgender. And she wrote, together with Carver Mead, she wrote the textbook, BLSI textbook on design rules. So she's a transgender. Doesn't show, really, does it? On top, Nobel Prize winner, Katalin Tariko, medicine, this year, left of her somebody who should have deserved the Nobel Prize, posthumous, because she died, uh, and her two colleagues got the Nobel Prize, uh, is Rosalind Franklin, the dark lady of, DNA, of uh, mRNA and DNA as well. Um, Ilham Kadri, Moroccan, very famous CEO in, uh, in Belgium, Solvay, must be known, I guess, Solvay. And there, other Nobel Prize winners, CRISPR, Doudna and Carpentier, Charpentier, Charpentier, I think. First lady in space, Russian. How was she called again? <sighs> I always forget. Valentina Tereshkova, first, first woman in space. If you look, you can have many, many of those role models. Talk about them. Make, make sure that you know them, that you know some of them in your business in your uh, specialty. Um, try to have always 50-50. If you talk about people, try to have 50-50 and have as much diversity uh, in the role models uh, you present. It really helps. Last thing is link STEM with societal relevance. And I'm not sure how STEM is taught in uh, France, um, in high school or in, at university. In Belgium, we're trying to really bring it to real life and multi, have multidisciplinary uh, um, classes where mathematics, uh, engineering, tech, technology, and science is brought together to solve a societal problem. That's how youngsters also get the meaning of how important it is uh, to know formulas, for example, because you can apply them uh, to a problem. And the STEM connectivity is uh, extremely important because it starts with science and math. They provide the basis for, uh, for what we uh, want to do. They provide the scientific basic knowledge to do something with it, to present, uh, to, to bring uh, a product to life or a process to life, which is the engineering. And the tools that are being made uh, improve the technology. And I talked about neuroscience and progress that has been made in the past 20 years. It's because of all these tools that have followed this uh, loop, this continuous loop. In the end, it's society uh, that benefits. So at the end, I have three takeaways uh, for you. One is that uh, if you uh, take care of an inclusive culture, it will uh, boost your innovation potential, and thus it will boost uh, your business uh, success. Two is that innovation contributes, of course, as you uh, logically know, uh, include contributes to societal, business, and human development uh, as a whole. And three, that the key capabilities of innovation are conflict of ideas, allowing error, and having an, atti uh, having an attitude for innovation, and uh, inclusion as number four. I'm done, but I wouldn't be a tech entrepreneur if I wouldn't have just one last thing to say, right? And that is, Yes, I may be crazy enough to think I can change the world. I still have 39 years to get there, maybe, and to move the needle uh, a little bit. And I hope I can be one that uh, does change the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maya, how did we do on time? Perfect. I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you again for the great talk. Uh, if anyone has any questions.
question needs to be asked. Now or after the podcast, uh, I maybe, guess. Uh, the yeah, could be now. I think there is a question. Thank you very much for this really nice presentation. I was wondering um, what in your everyday job um, did you do uh, to go toward more inclusion and what is the, the most difficult thing to do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe I can uh, start by saying that um, I have a brother, and my brother was always allowed to do more than I did. I found that to be completely unjust. So I've always rebelled against it. Um, and when uh, we founded our company, we were three co-founders, two men and me. Um, two engineers and me, a non-engineer, um, and I was the youngest on top of it. So um, I had one big luck, is that my two co-founders were both equally uh, convinced of the need for diversity and inclusion to come to innovation. Because we, we started it because we wanted to do something different than all the rest. Um, we wanted, we, we had a, a clear ID on how our, uh, how the culture of our company should, should be. And it should not be the, the typical corporate uh, thing, but a place where people could be themselves, could bring out the best in themselves and do something together, do really something that makes a difference. And I think that culture has, um, has somehow, um, yeah, been so pervasive that as we grew, it, um, even if it required attention and it required sometimes for, for any of us to say, okay, you're, you're trespassing. This is not what we expect. This is not inclusive. Um, typically, when we look at uh, composing teams, then we look at uh, the perspectives of the team, not only in gender, could also be in character. If you have a, a team of only extroverts, uh, alpha people who always want to speak uh, first, yet you get to a chaotic uh, team that accomplishes nothing. So you need also in your team to be extremely attentive to uh, the, the multi-perspectives. So that is one very clear, um, uh, action that we've always uh, done. Um, I've been 18 years CEO. I think having a female CEO, and I was an exception in the industry for a semiconductor company. I, do, I think Christine King uh, is, is one of the others. Lisa Su is, uh, is, is one of the others. Uh, but that's it, you have many more. <laughs> Uh, we, w we were really exceptions in the, in the semiconductor world, and I think that helps also. So if you, again, if you can see it, you can be it. So if you make sure that your executive team, for example, is also as diverse as possible, um, then it attracts uh, people. And yeah, it's, it's in fact having constant attention uh, to it, and if you don't give it sufficient attention, it also slides back because you have these, uh, I mean, you, you don't, we don't live in a vacuum. Um, and, and it's also not because I was, uh, uh, I was uh, a co-founder that uh, people automatically, I mean, male engineers, if I can call them that way, automatically respected me. I had to earn uh, my respect. Um, so even in a culture that is that wants to be inclusive, you cannot uh, let go of uh, the attention for it. So I hope that somehow answers yeah, a bit your question. Two more. Thank you very much for your talk. 
Oh yes, uh, absolutely. So that is a bias. bias. Yeah, exactly. Do you have any, any, any advice on how we can? Uh, uh well, uh, the 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 first thing is you are already conscious of it, and being aware of your own unconscious bias is the first step towards uh, doing better. And then you have to put energy in uh, becoming. Yeah, you, you go through a whole loop. Huh? You, you first are unconsciously unaware, then you become consciously aware of your bias. Then you need to uh, take the next step and become consciously non-biased. And you do that by really talking or reading opposing opinions, uh, going to people that... Oh, that you say, ah, oh, I don't know them uh, so well and they don't resemble me, so mm, I probably cannot talk to them. And you will discover that in the end, they bring you a lot. It's the same with political ideas. Uh, if you want to uh, really understand uh, what it takes, then you need to read and uh, listen to different opinions so you can form a better opinion. Uh, in the end. And the last step is if you have put a lot of energy in yeah, taking opposing views, uh, talking to people that don't resemble you, you will at some point in time become unconsciously unbiased in certain aspects. Caveat, you will have to redo the circle for any bias that you discover in yourself. But having that consciousness and being already aware uh, of this makes it uh, makes your brain, by the way, much much better. So I would uh, advise it to everyone. Your colleague. Thank you for it. So I have two small questions. So about the gap in the university. Yes. So I think that for a lot of in Europe since uh, a few decades there is more women in all superior degrees achieving um, degrees in university etc but there is like a lack of women in STEM fields yes. so is this lack progressing uh, decreasing in a way and also do we know why uh, women which are in the majority in a superior degree don't choose STEM fields is it because they think it is not for them because they think they, think they are not interested in this field. You have an hour? <laughs> okay, I'll try to be brief. Uh, it's a question I love, because finally we have understood pretty much, I mean, we, we never understand everything, but the, the majority of the reasons behind it we meanwhile understand. And... Um, I already talked about uh, what we offer as parents or caretakers uh, towards boys and girls. And that the brain of a, uh, or a boy's brain doesn't follow the same journey as, as a girl's brain. When they, so th that's about toys. But going, for example, to primary school, uh, it is also a fact that boys are being praised when they get things right and being criticized for having bad behavior. And girls are being criticized not for, they are being praised for good behavior and being criticized for getting things wrong. It's the opposite. Think about what that do does to your self-esteem and your self-confidence. If you're always being criticized for getting things wrong, but you're a nice girl, so I'm, I'm glad, or the opposite. Self-esteem is the largest um, reason for 
not feeling that you belong. STEM is, and that's uh, combined with STEM is for boys, is a boys thing. You feel you don't belong. And if you know that the, the pain of social rejection uh, is activating the same areas in your brain as physical pain, then what will you do? You will avoid being in that group that doesn't resemble you, where you don't feel you fit. And if you don't have role models that tell you something else, um, then it's very difficult for a girl to, yeah, and all the girls that are here and did follow a STEM uh, uh, educational career, and even now doing a PhD in STEM, you have survived with all these headwinds. It's incredible. And the same reason is true when uh, you see that many more uh, women in technical roles, even if they go to a technical, in a technical role in a company, they drop out, they, many more drop out than men. And that's also because they don't have the feeling that they belong. So if we want to change things, we really have to understand uh, the, the bombardment of these gender stereotypes that we continuously get. And the fact that uh, you have an unwel you feel unwelcomed, and it, I mean, men don't do that by, I mean, deliberately, they, they don't even know, yeah? They don't even know because they are unconsciously biased. They don't know. Um, so it's only by, yeah, making sure they uh, understand that a welcoming environment is important for everyone. And for any un underrepresented person, a uh, person that comes from a different culture, um, we have 50 nationalities. One of the things, and referring back to your question earlier, if we have people from uh, Malaysia coming to, uh, to Belgium to visit or to, uh, to work together, you need to somehow, you need to welcome them as well. If you don't welcome them, they will feel rejected and they won't contribute as it should. So, but if you are conscious of that, that definitely people who are underrepresented and are a bit of a, yeah, a, a strange animal in, um, in the team or in, in, in the group, they need an active welcoming if you do that, then you get also the best out of uh, people. The, the best advice that I have ever, because that's one of the, the questions in the podcast, but I'm allowed to already yeah. exercise a bit, okay? So one of the best advices that I ever got from a, a mentor uh, of mine, uh, that was uh, pretty much at the, at the beginning when I, I was CEO, because yeah, I was young, I was a, uh, mostly the only woman in the room. Uh, I was uh, mostly the only non-engineer in a group of engineers when I went to customers, for example. So, blah, 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 blah. And he said, Francoise, come on, you are the CEO. Be your role. Don't be your gender. Don't be your age. Don't be where you come from. Be your role. And I discovered only afterwards that, in fact, he gave me a workaround a workaround around an unwelcoming environment because that's how I felt at the time. And I persevered, of course, thanks to a lot of uh, uh, support in, in the company and my co-founders and, and the team, etc. and the inclusive culture that we had, we could at least uh, help people like me to be our role, because the unwelcoming environment should not be there in the first place. If we want to achieve something together, we should welcome all the talents that we can get. So, okay. Thank you. any more question? That's it. Okay, great. Thank you for your questions and your attention.
keep this microphone? Uh, no? no? Hello. Hello. That works. the camera it's okay perfect okay so hello again and welcome to the one degree higher a podcast dedicated to breaking barriers empowering women in science we envision a world where young women fearlessly delve into scientific discoveries leading with innovation and creativity so today i'm pleased to welcome Françoise Chambard a chair of uh, Malex chairwoman of Malex's and also uh, the president of STEM platform, which is an advisory board to the Flemish government, uh, aiming to uh, encourage young people to pursue a science, uh, technology, engineering, or mathematics education. So again, thank you for, have, for being with us today. I guess I can start uh, with my first question. Absolutely. Okay. Thank so you for having me. So first, uh, could you please provide an overview of uh, your career journey and uh, share what motivated you uh, to continue a career in science and uh, leading you to uh, your role as a chairwoman? Okay, well, I have to start by saying that I have a degree in applied languages, which wasn't exactly a predictor uh, for me uh, being, yeah, having had the career in uh, um, in semiconductors as I had. Uh, but in fact, I fell in love with technology. In fact, I fell in love twice, once with my husband and once with technology. <laughs> and uh, the, the reason, and my husband is an engineer, so that's, uh, th that, that was very helpful too, because he was one of my best teachers uh, as such, a design engineer, so um, semiconductor design engineer. Um, and I fell in love with technology, uh, at during my uh, studies um, because the Flemish government had uh, started off, I think it was beginning of the 80s, um, a program that was called um, Flanders Technology International. Mm -hmm. And uh, it comprised lots of things, but one of them was uh, a, a trade show that happened for the first time while I was studying where yeah, technological innovations from everywhere in the world were being presented uh, at a yeah at a trade show, and so we, I went there with with my friends, and I was like Alice in Wonderland. I said, "Wow, is all of this possible with technology?" Because in a language degree, I'm sorry, you don't hear a lot about science, and yeah. you hear about linguistics and and uh, as science, but that that that's about it. So there, and and really, I was always quite interested in how things work. Um, and when things broke at home, I, I always tried to uh, to fix them. It usually didn't work. <laughs> I had a lot of errors, <laughs> but sometimes it did. Um, and, um, and and I was fond of building things, mm -hmm. um, even bricks and mortar things. So I loved to do that uh, somehow. So in, in, in that sense, I, I was interested in everything that was technical. And my first job was in a, a textile uh, machinery company. I worked there for one year. And then my husband and I went to work for a uh, semiconductor startup in Germany. Um, well, he was asked to go and work there. And I said, what? I have a job, I don't want to lose my job here, and anyhow, I want uh, to work, yeah? I'm not going to sit at home. And so I got a job too, because of uh, the, the language skills that I had. And I started off because we were number 13 and 14 in that startup, so it was a real small uh, company. Um, 
and we met our third co-founder there, and that's in fact how uh, we, how the idea got uh, into motion that oh we could also start up our own company, mm -hmm. which I thought you have drunk too much. Uh, how could we ever? <laughs> set up our own company but if you look at it we were quite complementary with one another mm -hmm. and uh, our third co-founder was also a bit older than us had had already uh, done uh, a lot of things he was like 14 15 years older and that's how it started in a small engineering company and then it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew mm -hmm. uh, and melexis is one of the, the companies mm -hmm. we have other companies the, the largest one is the foundry, so Melexis mm -hmm. is the product company, and Xfab is uh, the foundry. Okay. So as a woman in a leadership role, uh, could you share some of major challenges you faced within uh, your career and how you overcame them? Yeah, the largest, uh, um, the largest challenge that I had is um, that even if I was a co-founder, I was not immediately accepted by the engineering community. Mm -hmm. And the way, uh, because I, I always want to understand how things work, I asked a lot of questions, sometimes really stupid questions, basic questions. Mm -hmm. But that's how I learned um, the, the trade uh, in the first place, but also, in some cases, um, I overheard they ha were having a problem and they couldn't solve the problem. And then I said sometimes, hey, did you already think about this? Something that they hadn't thought about at all. And then there was, when there was a silence, a long silence, and then they said, ah, oh, yes, I know that. And then they continued to, I said, yeah, I've put my finger on something they hadn't thought of before. One of the insights uh, of how important inclusion is for innovation is exactly that. Because many engineering deadlocks have been solved by people who are not engineers at all. It's mm. just because they look at it in a different way. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the most important challenge that I had. And I knew that I had won the challenge. Uh, and that took me a couple of years for sure. I knew I had won the challenge when I didn't have to go myself uh, and present uh, a question, but they came and they said, Francoise, can you please come and listen to us because we don't seem to progress and we don't know where it comes from. And it's then that I said, oh yes, that was the second step that I needed is that they recognized that I could contribute even if I wasn't uh, an engineer. And uh, have you ever faced a gender-related obstacle within your oh, career? Oh, plenty. Yeah. <laughs> plenty. Uh, when I sometimes went to a customer visit mm -hmm. um, with a colleague, and that colleague was male, then and sometimes reporting to me, yeah, uh, one of my team, they addressed the male. Uh, saying sir this and that and and then they didn't address me for example or they thought I was the secretary uh, mm. so I had this multiple times the most the, the and that didn't really hurt me as such it made me even more persistent mm -hmm. um, and I was my role uh, that was one of the best advices that I've ever had from a mentor is don't be your gender, don't be your age, don't be where you came from, but be your role. Um, a nice workaround uh, for an unwelcoming environment, but uh, yeah, you still have to, you will still have to face it uh, in one way or another. But the, the, one, the, the thing that hurt me most was um, um, something that happened in Japan. And Japan is not known to be a very women-friendly society. And uh, we were in a very heated negotiation uh, with a um, uh, yeah with with a company, um, no matter what the name was. And the the it was a legal dispute, and I was leading the the negotiation. Um, and on the other side were all men, but one. Uh, lady and that was their legal counsel 
And of course, I had my Japanese colleagues also uh, because yeah, a lot of translation uh, needs to be done. Uh, these are very lengthy negotiations with Japanese. Um, and uh, my Japanese colleagues told me afterwards, so the negotiation, by the way, was successful, uh, took, took a bit of time and a, a couple of uh, iterations, but the negotiation was in the end satisfactory for both parties, which is the best negotiation you can have, the best result. And uh, my Japanese colleagues uh, afterwards told me that um, the lady who was the, the, the counsel, so the legal counsel, she had um, called me a bitch. Oops. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> That's, that was the, the yeah. one that, if, if it would have been a man, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been hurt. But because it was a lady, mm -hmm. I was really hurt, and it, but that was the only, the only uh, instance I've ever lived where it was mm. a woman uh, not supporting the, uh, not that she had to give me a privilege because I was a woman, but I thought it was the opposite of what you should expect, mm -hmm. and I think uh, sisterhood, um, respect, uh, support. Alliances, female alliances, are so incredibly important uh, for yeah, not feeling. I, I had a real pain of social rejection at mm. that that moment, but that was afterwards. Uh, I never saw her again, uh, and my Japanese colleague only told me uh, after it was all done uh, because it would have really hurt my feelings during the negotiation. Yeah. So luckily, they didn't speak about it. But I think that is uh, extremely important to understand that um, we need to make feel to make people feel welcomed in any environment, whether you're a young person uh, coming into a new job and you don't feel welcomed, oh, not good. Whether you're the only woman in the room of uh, or the only non-engineer in a group of engineers and you feel unwelcome, it hurts and the we n meanwhile know through neuroscientific uh, uh, research that the pain of social rejection um, uh, activates the same areas in your brain as physical pain. So it, mm -hmm. it's clear that you avoid it as much as possible or something else is wrong in your brain, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. There might be some exceptions to that. But in general, People want to feel welcomed. People want to feel it's my in-group. I belong here. I feel welcome. Uh, and I can be myself. And that's extremely important in companies um, to have this inclusive culture, uh, to foster it, uh, to speak up when uh, you see something that is not really um, yeah, fitting uh, that culture, and when you act upon it. And people can learn. I mean, we have all our unconscious biases, and you shouldn't shame or blame uh, people because of that, but yeah. you do have to talk about it and explain, you know, when you said this, it made me feel like that. Mm. Or even, and that's an advice I would give to, to men in general in, in technical mm. environments when they, have, uh, when they want to f make women feel welcome, is that they have to listen in the first place. They really have to listen, not speak, but listen. Uh, they should support, uh, and that follows the listening, because if you don't know what the needs of a person are, you don't know how to support them, and the needs could be very, very different, and men are sometimes really blissfully unaware of female realities. Mm -hmm. um, and three, sponsorship. Uh, talk about... Uh, your sponsee, <laughs> I don't know if that word exists, by the one you sponsor, talk about her when she's not there. And that's uh, extremely important that you have also men, and I've had many men in my career, uh, also many women in my career, who spoke well about me when I was not there. I mm. don't know, but I know they did. Uh, I know for sure they did. And that is extremely uh, helpful. For, so again, alliances, sponsorship, uh, supporting, mentorship, 
uh, are all things that are important for anyone, whether it's a man or a, or a woman, mm -hmm. to be able to bring out the best in yourself. Okay. So uh, I would uh, have to ask you again about the mentorship. Uh, yes. So it's often seen as a vital component in uh, empowering women in science. It's like by offering guidance, uh, aspiration, and support. So how exactly was mentorship? Uh, like, do you have any other mentorship other than uh, the one you mentioned before? I've so had many. I've mm -hmm. had many mentors. And um, I think one of the, um, one of the uh, good pieces of advice I would like to give uh, as well to anyone, uh, mm -hmm. if you're young in your career, uh, ask. Ask whether someone to anyone mm -hmm. that you feel this person can really bring me uh, a lot. I'd like to understand how they arrived at the sp spot they, they are in. I'd like to pick their brain on uh, their experience, etc. My experience is that if you ask, I have not had anyone who said no to me, who did not go and mm -hmm. take even five minutes, even if it were only five minutes, to yeah, tell me about a question that I had. Uh, or could, could we go into a, a longer term mentorship? Can I call you once in a while if I'm stuck with a problem? Mm -hmm. Everyone I asked, they all said yes. And I see that also in my mentees. And I give that, also, I mentor uh, a, a lot of very different uh, people. If there is a question around, could you help me with something, uh, or could you be my mentor? There, sometimes they really ask it like yes. that. Then I all usually say yes, and then we have to see uh, how we manage the time, how we manage uh, mm. to meet each other. But even a, a simple phone call can already do a lot to unlock yeah, uh, sometimes a blocker that you have in your head. So if you're uh, if you are young to anything, yeah, or new to any group, look for look for those people that you can address, mm -hmm. and they will usually say yes. Hopefully. <laughs> so, what about uh, balancing a successful career and a personal life? How do you effectively manage this balance? Well, I've got news for you: you don't. Oh. There is no <laughs> such thing as balancing mm -hmm. uh, your private and your professional mm -hmm. life. They always get entangled with each other and uh, you can you should not think that ah I have it all under control you don't yeah. your kid can get sick overnight uh, and you don't have that under control mm -hmm. your customer might be saying I need this tomorrow first thing in the morning seven o'clock in the morning and you don't have that under control so I have oh, we have my husband and I we have three kids um, and I couldn't imagine a life without them. Uh, and they were born, I mean, Melexis was born in 89, uh, or the predecessor of Melexis, I, legally speaking, I have to say, uh, was born in 89. Our first daughter was born in 90, so one year after, and our twins were born in 92. So that was whew, a whole lot of balls to keep uh, in the air. And I was following an MBA. And I said, this doesn't work anymore. I mean, I had to drop something. Um, and um, the, the, that's also something that is hurting, is that you, as a mother, um, and fathers don't have that problem, as a mother, you are always blamed by the outside world for mm -hmm. anything that goes wrong with your kid. Yeah, you have to sacrifice maybe a lot more than... Uh yeah, but you're, uh, when uh, when our eldest daughter went uh, to um, uh, first time went uh, into kindergarten, the twins were still with her preferred uh, um, uh, nurse, uh, and she was jealous of that, and she did all kinds of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. It was my fault. I was the bad mother because I wasn't there for her. Uh, and that's um, and and they never blamed uh, the father, and that's really hurtful. And it's the the lady who was um, 
who was taking the responsibility or organizing the daycare centers in our region that I talked to and I said, I really have trouble. It's not going well. Um, and when you're stressed, then you, it, you, you give that to your kids as well. Sure. So you get into a, a pretty vicious circle. Mm -hmm. I'll spare you the details. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she, she, she talked to me only 10 minutes and that really was a life-changing experience. So you don't sometimes need too much time to, uh, to have a life-changing uh, experience. And uh, she told me, but what do you want to reach in your life? What, what is important for you? And, and I said, yeah, yeah we, we started this, off this company. I wanted to succeed. I like my job. I, I, I'm excited about all the new things we're doing. And she said, well, wow, sounds like a great, uh, a, a, a great profession. I said, yes, yes, yes. But yeah, you have uh, the teacher of, uh, of my daughter that says this. My uh, mother-in-law at the time also <laughs> was criticizing me. I, I love my mother-in-law now because we had a good talk. She understood. And since then, we're the best friends. Really, really, honestly. <laughs> um, and then she said, you need to make a choice or choice says, you choose what is the most important for you, what matters most to you. Think about it, write it down. And what mattered most to me, so I, I got really that close of quitting my job at the time, so I wouldn't have sat mm. here uh, if it wasn't for the lady organizing the daycare centers in our region. Uh, I really got this close. And because of what uh, she instilled in, um, in that conversation, I said, okay, well, what matters really, really to me is, of course, our kids. I want them to grow up and feel happy about uh, their lives. Um, and I want the company to succeed. My fourth kid, I want it to succeed. And then it was clear for me that I had to uh, throw out all the rest of, of the stuff. So I, I quit the MBA mm -hmm. because I couldn't manage anymore. Quit the MBA. My house was looking sometimes like the World War II battlefield. <laughs> um, the, I did not visit family anymore. I did not, at least not during a long, long bit of time. Mm -hmm. And I really made the choice, I want this to succeed, the family, needs to succeed. Uh, I need to be there when they need me. And I had a fantastic, and I still have, <laughs> a fantastic partner uh, with whom I had also this conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't get to see much of each other because we always switched roles. So when he was, he was traveling for work, I was home and vice versa. So the good thing is we could really yeah, make Balance. our, our yeah. agendas match. Mm -hmm. And the kids always knew where we were. Uh, we had uh, this, this uh, um, world map, well, ball, like uh, with, a, with a light inside. And when, when I was in, I don't know, uh, in, in the US or, or, or he was in Japan or whatever, yeah, in Korea, we always looked, ah, there, I'm going there. And, and mm -hmm. so they learned to know the, the map. And that was for them kind of, ah, we know where mommy is, we mm -hmm. know where, where daddy is. And for them, that gave them uh, a sense of, um, of, of safe, uh, safety. Mm. And, and we always came back. So we always said, and we'll be back then. And we were always back then. So that's for the them, best thing for them, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how... Uh, so it, I, I did not always balance. or mm. Balance is really bogus. I learned that somewhere in a book. But it said balance is bogus. Mm -hmm. Balance is a is a movement. You you have to. There is no static balance. So thinking that you can reach that, you will always have to move. And sometimes you have to move a lot in order yeah. to uh, keep up. And sometimes it's it's easier. And now of course it's easier. They all have their own lives. Uh, I've uh, I, uh, we welcomed our first grandchild uh, not too long ago. And it's fantastic, uh, so. That's great. So uh, lastly, uh, would you give a piece of advice uh, for young women who are uh, considering a job, a career in science, or aspiring a leadership role in an industry? 
Well, I would say uh, follow, so think about what matters to you, mm. what matters most to you. Uh, be very persistent in, in that area. But if you feel that you're in an unwelcoming environment and y by talking to people in your environment, you don't seem, they don't seem to get it and you still feel that you don't belong, go to a place where you do feel welcome. Uh, because you cannot bring out the best in yourself if you're somehow self-silencing, because that's where it, what it leads to. You self-silence, you don't speak up anymore. Uh, you hide, uh, as it were, and then you cannot bring the best uh, uh, of yourself mm -hmm. to, to the organization that you're working in. So it's, for neither of the two parties, it's, it's good. But start by uh, looking for alliances. Uh, start by, f so if you are in an unwelcoming environment, mm -hmm. look for alliances, look for sponsors, uh, look for mentors. And if that doesn't solve it, go to another organization where you should uh, have a more welcoming environment. That would be... Uh, that would be my advice because be your role is also a good advice, yeah. but in the end, it's still only a workaround uh, yeah. for uh, something that should not be like that. Mm. Uh, but in some cases, uh, it's it's a very good advice because you even if you have a welcoming environment in the job you have, you can go to suppliers, you can go to customers, you can go to a shop where you feel unwelcome as well. So you will always have to somehow, uh, yeah, be strong enough mm -hmm. to um, uh, to weather those uh, situations. But if you have a good home, let's say, no matter how that home looks like, if you got a good good home uh, and good social relations, good friends, and a and a welcoming uh, professional environment, then I think that's how you bloom. That's how you can really uh, get the best out of yourself. Thank you. You're so welcome. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the uh, IEEE Lee Student Branch, we deeply thank you for the uh, invaluable time and insights you've generously given uh, give for us today. And uh, we're pleased to have you here at Junia. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you for having me. OK, so if anyone uh, would like to ask or add anything, please feel free. Yeah, Kevin. Um, well, the, the, the first thing is um, that you acknowledge that you have done something wrong uh, of, or failed uh, in somebody or, or something. Uh, th that, uh, that is, I think, the first step. Uh, the second one is uh, to yeah, take, take a step back and look at, okay, what happened? Uh, why did it happen? Could, could I have avoided uh, it? Um, and what could I do to not repeat the same mistake uh, in the future? And, um, and that's really it, um, and, and go on. And what is important in, in the organization uh, for Milexis, it's a clear rule, you are allowed to make mistakes. You are not fired because you make a mistake. Uh, but what we do expect is that you do that step back, you look at, okay, what can I learn from this and what can others learn uh, from, from it? And you continue and what is, but what, and we don't punish you for that. We would punish, I, punishing is, is not a word that we like to use, but we don't punish uh, mistakes. What we do say upfront is um, you have a waterline 
uh, a company is like a boat and you have a waterline. And when your mistake is under the waterline and will sink the boat, oh, please yeah, think about it twice. Uh, talk to people before you take that step. If it fails, uh, that you can do. If it's above the waterline and you take a certain risk, uh, it's above the waterline, then you can learn from it. So we allow mistakes. What we do not allow is that you uh, hide your mistake. And that sometimes is very uh, important not to hide your mistake because it can, if you, when you notice it, uh, we make <laughs> semiconductors, sensors, drivers for cars. If that part goes into a braking system and you know you've made a f an error there and you don't talk about it, yeah, then you have lots of chips that will not function. Uh, so you bring your customers in, uh, in trouble and you could also bring users, uh, uh, drivers in, uh, in, uh, yeah, in, in deadly situations. So it, it's important you don't hide it. And as we don't punish for mistakes, Normally, people don't hide it. Um, and what is even worse than hiding it is saying, ah, but it was not me, it was the other one. That we are also very allergic to. And if you have that culture of, okay, you can openly talk about your mistakes and let's see how we can, yeah, repair it, correct it, uh, how, or, and if we can't, how we can avoid it uh, for the future in any case, then I think you have also a much speedier uh, way of doing business um, and a much more collaborative uh, culture. I guess uh, we're, we're done. <laughs> okay. No one wants Thank you very much anything. for your attention. Uh, Thanks for you, actually. <laughs> okay. Thank you.